Channel 2 News at 5.30, our two on your side town hall. We are so glad that you're with us. I'm Mary Ellis Demler. And hello everybody, I'm Michael Wooten. The easiest way to send us a question or share your thoughts is to text 849-2200. Ahead for us today, mandatory vaccine. A lot of you have asked us if you can be forced to get the shot. We're going to have a top expert joining us to talk about that. Plus, high school sports, an update today on which are allowed, which are not, and what the state will be monitoring as we head into the fall. And absentee voting, the change that happened today in Erie County for folks who plan to vote by mail. First, though, a severe weather alert. We want to let you know right off the top that we're following the potential for storms moving through western New York this evening and overnight. Yeah, the main threat could be for some damaging winds and possible hail. Heather Waldman will join us live to time it all out a little bit later in the show. Now to a COVID question that you may not have considered. We don't know exactly when it will happen, Michael, but most experts think that we will have a coronavirus vaccine early next year. At that point, is your boss legally allowed to force you to get it? Yeah, some people are just anti-vaccine, but others worry that the process this time around has just been too fast with not enough testing. Well, a Gallup poll recently found that one in three Americans said that they would not get the vaccine, even if it were free and FDA approved. Now you, ha you have some experts out there who are calling for mandatory vaccinations for everybody to protect public health, although that seems highly unlikely. But what about that employer question? Well, we are fortunate to have the perfect person to talk us through this issue tonight. That's right. Her name is Dorit Rice. She is a law professor with the University of California Hastings in San Francisco, and she is an expert on vaccine requirements, and she's joining us live. Professor, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for having me. It is good to see you. Let's start here with just the fundamental question. Is it legal for an employer to require a worker to get this vaccine? Professor, can a boss say to somebody, get it or you can't work here? Yes, with some limits. So in the United States, your employer can set health and safety rules for your workplace to protect you and others. Uh, that's not controversial and you can choose to walk if that's not what you want. Employers are private, are, private employers are private entities and they have their own rights, including the rights to make their workplace safe. So employers can require a vaccine. There are some legal obstacles they need to be aware of. Give us a First, little... Give us yeah, an idea what those would be. So uh, I'm going to start with something that's not exactly a, a legal requirement, but if there's a collective bargaining agreement, usually you have to uh, look at it closely. It might require you to talk to the union and coordinate with the union before you require that as an employer. Second, there are two anti-discrimination law that may limit what employers can do. First, the American Disabilities Act says that if someone has a disability, and that would include a medical contraindication to the vaccine, a medical reason not to be vaccinated, they have to be accommodated with very few exceptions. One exception might be if there are direct threats. So if it's a workplace that has very high levels of COVID, you might say, I'm sorry, I know that you have a real medical reason, but accommodating you would be a direct threat to others. Can't do it. Uh, the other exception is if it's a substantial burden, a significant burden on the employer to uh, uh, not accommodate. Now remember, accommodation can mean allowing the employee to work from home, allowing the employee to work with a mask. So there's a whole range of options between saying get the vaccine and be fired. Hmm. All the right. last legal, sorry, go on. No, keep going. The last one, I'll the, let you finish. The last legal limit is from the Civil Rights Act of 1964 which says employers can discriminate on things like race, but also religion. And here, an employee with sincere religious objection to the vaccine can require an accommodation unless it's an undue burden. Here, however, the, uh, uh, bur the burden can be pretty small. If it's more than a minimal burden, the employer does not have to accommodate the employee. Hmm. All right, very good. So uh, you actually answered what was my next question. <laughs> An employee then really does have options. 
uh, to not get the vaccine, depending on their individual circumstances. So thank you for making that clear. Uh, Michael, you can jump in with your next question. Yeah, so Professor, um, we should let everyone know because there is some vaccine news today. Um, Moderna, which is doing one of the vaccines um, and is kind of a leading candidate here in the United States, came out with um, some very early findings in their vaccine trials. Looks promising, especially for their elderly patients. But again, it's very early and all of this science is still happening. But what is your gut feeling about a vaccine? And I know that you look at this so closely and, and what you say to, to people out there who worry about if a vaccine is going to be safe and effective. Two things. First, it's too early to know for any of the candidates, as you just pointed out. Second, we have an incredible uh, array of oversight mechanisms. I listened today to four hours of the meeting of the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices, where they discuss how they're monitoring COVID-19 vaccine safety. They not only have four um, oversight systems that look for signals constantly, they're going to add active monitoring by sending people questionnaires who got the vaccine and so forth. So we have an incredible array of oversight. The only concern is, will there be efforts to politically override it? And that's always a concern. Mm. So we have the tools in place. If, if the oversight mechanisms are allowed to work, that the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices and the CDC, that the vaccine-related product uh, and related product advisory committee in the FDA, if they can do their job, we're in good hands. Well, doctor, I know that uh, your expertise is on vaccines in the law, but let me ask you your opinion again. Um, how many people do you think, what percentage of our population would have to take the vaccine for it to create that necessary herd immunity? That is to say that enough people are taking it to slow down the spread of the virus or hopefully eliminate it. Is there some base percentage that we need to see happen in the U.S. in order for it to be effective and do what we want it to do for our country's population? That's a question for an epidemiologist, and I think even they are not sure yet. For measles, we need 95% because it's so contagious. COVID-19 is not as contagious as measles, so it's probably less than 95%, but I think we don't know yet. I hope epidemiologists speak to this question now. Yeah, we don't want to push you outside your expertise because we really appreciate everything you're able uh, to bring us about the law because there seems to be just so many questions and concerns from people knowing that the vaccine happened in such a speedy way. And this really is unprecedented, isn't it? The speed at which this vaccine yes. is being developed. Yes, it is. Now, you mentioned that the vaccines may be available early next year. The clinical trials that are going on now are between a year and two years. They're not going to be done by early next year. What could happen at the beginning of next year is that there'll be an emergency use authorization uh, based on early promising data. If we have more than what we have now and enough, the vaccine could be allowed to be used as an emergency uh, under whatever conditions the FDA sets. So that's what we're looking at right now. We will have two years of data from the trial at least. Yeah. Something we will continue to follow closely. Professor Dorit Rice with the University of California Hastings College of Law. Uh, very illuminating and answered a lot of our viewers' questions about this, especially the employer question and all of this. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right, let's turn right now to some Decision 2020 news on our town hall. Today, the Erie County Board of Elections announced that its online absentee ballot portal is up and running. Registered voters can go to elections.erie.gov and request an absentee ballot or check the status of a pending request. The governor recently signed into law a bill that declares the COVID-19 pandemic an excuse so any registered voter can get an absentee ballot by mail. You can make your request now, but keep in mind the actual ballot isn't certified yet, so those cannot go out in the mail until at least the middle of next month. Yeah, now we know that you have a lot of questions about this November's election. So tomorrow we hope to get you a lot of answers. We're going to be joined by the commissioners, at least one of them, but we think both from the Erie County Board of Elections. They'll be joining us right here on our town hall. 
All you have to do is text us those questions, 849-2200, if you have something you would love for us to ask. And judging on who we've heard from so far, a lot of questions, Mary Ells. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an unprecedented time, and mm -hmm. it makes sense that folks would want to make sure they're understanding all these new rules and regulations. Everyone wants their vote, of course, to count. Absolutely. Look forward to that tomorrow. But coming up on our town hall today, from the First Lady to other family members and government officials, our Verify team goes through the speeches from last night, night two of the Republican convention. And a little bit later, an update on Hurricane Laura as we also keep an eye on potential severe weather here in western New York, too. Stay with us.